give you a little brief information about why my involvement in this, and Darlene's actually doing the presentation. Um, I grew up in Calhoun, Tennessee, which is across the river from where Fort Cass is. And of course, that was the oldest uh, town in McNean County. And if you're familiar with the name of John Walker and Jack Walker, you know a little bit about this because John Walker founded the city of Calhoun, the little town. And the reason I mention that is because when you do research and you read about Fort Cass and the Indian Agency, it references Calhoun, Tennessee. And so it really was not in Calhoun on the north side of the river. It was on the south side of the river. The reason they talked about that was because Calhoun was where the post office was and the churches were. There are several of the Cherokees um, and Cherokee descendants that are buried in the cemetery across the river on the north side in Calhoun because there, that was all new at that time. So you can see how that happened. It's a source of confusion and we really wanted to claim it for a while, but we're going to give up. And, then, <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm a researcher for the um, Charleston uh, Calhoun Hiawassee Historical Society in our new Heritage Center. But I have I lived there. I moved away for 40 years and in the last two years, I came back into that area and I stayed there about half the time and have done, gotten really involved in all of this. So I'm very new. This is my first visit to one of these meetings. And so it's been a pleasure to meet all of you. And now I'm going to turn this over to Darlene and I'm going to be her assistant. <laughs> and one other thing, if you have any questions we can't answer, I will help take those back and we will research them for you to help find some answers. Okay, as I said, my name is Darlene Goins. Um, I'm the treasurer for the Charleston Calhoun Hawassi Historical Society and I'm facilities manager for the Hawassi River Heritage Center. Um, before I actually start talking about Fort Cass, I want to give you a little bit of background as to why I'm involved in this. I'm not Cherokee. I've tried, but I can't find a bit of Cherokee in me. I'm like most of the people that I know in our area that I talk to say, oh yeah, I, I'm Cherokee. Um, but I'm not, I, I don't claim it. So if somebody wants to adopt me, you know, <laughs> I'm ready. Um, but uh, I grew up in Charleston, lived in Charleston or the surrounding area all my life. Always knew there was a port there, had always heard of Fort Cass, always knew Lewis Ross had a house there, which I grew up believing the house that's there now was Lewis Ross's house. Um, there has been so much in misinformation about Fort Cass through the years. And until recently, nobody has been interested in trying to find out what was wrong and make it right. Uh, nobody has wanted to anybody to come in. People have been, I believe, Dr. West came to Charleston, what, about 20, 15 years ago or something? Before I did. <laughs> several, several years ago, ago, anyway. Russ Townsend had been in Charleston. They had both knocked on doors, tried to talk to people. Nobody would talk to them. Why? I don't know. Did they not know the story? I honestly don't believe my parents knew the story. And my Grandparents, my, my mother's family has been in Charleston since before the Civil War. But nothing, none of that was ever passed down. Not even really the Civil War stories, other than the fact that Sherman was there. That was a big deal. But, uh, I, you know, I knew there were any, I knew everybody I knew was out collecting arrowheads along the river. But I did not know the extent of what happened in my little town. Charleston, Tennessee. Charleston, Tennessee is still one square mile, just like it was when the town was platted years ago. It's never grown. So then Shirley Lawrence went to Melissa Woody at the Chamber of Commerce and she said, y'all got a national story that you need to be telling. And this is like, what are you talking about? We've got big clay. She's like, I'm not talking about big clay. I'm talking about four cats. So that got interest peaked. Melissa started coming to uh, city meetings in Charleston. A few of us met 
at city meetings in Charleston who are now prime players in that. Faye Callaway sitting back there, she was our very first president of the Historical Society, and she was the first one that stood up in a city council meeting and said, Mr. Mayor, I think we've got enough interest to form a historical society here in Charleston. So the groundwork was set. And between our two little towns, both of our towns, Charleston and Calhoun, have been tied through history so many times. And Laura, like she said, is from Calhoun. Well, she's also my cousin. So more than just historically family-oriented, too, has, has tied those two little towns. And um, Charleston Calhoun Hawassi Historical Society was born. And in 2008, I think we've got another slide there. In 2008, I think it was January of 2008, they had their first meeting. By the end of the year, we were chartered. Um, less than a year later, we were talking about what our plans would be for the future. And a heritage center, and at that time we were calling it a greenway, were two of our plans. This would have been, this was an interpretive greenway. And all this time we've been doing more research. Faye got us, Faye got, Faye's the one that got me started coming to these meetings in Alabama. And um, coming to meetings like this helped us to talk to the right people that knew the right things and, and helped us uh, to get where we are today. So um, through the years, uh, you know, a little bit more about the fact that I've been in Charleston all these years. <clears throat> like I said, my parent, my, my family, my mother's family has been there since before the Civil War. My mother went to Charleston High School. I went to Charleston High School. My kids went to Charleston High School, and now my grandkids are in Charleston Elementary School. So that's how grounded our family is in that little tiny. <coughs> so when we started talking, we, we didn't know what we were going to be up against when we started talking to people about our plans and what we wanted to do. Um, but our little city council has been so great to help us. Um, they're one of our partners. After we purchased this building for a heritage center, they agreed to pay all of our utilities. We have so many great partners. Uh, uh, of course, uh, MTSU, Center for Historic Preservation, the National Park Service, everything that they have done for us has been just fabulous. So let's move on. So, um, a little bit about the Historical Society, who we were chartered in 2008. Our average monthly attendance was 40. So, you know, it, it, we go to McMinn Historical Society meetings, and we go to Bradley County Historical Society meetings. Sometimes there's 10 or 12 people there. So we feel really blessed that we have the interest that we have in our historical society meeting. Our meetings are the third Sunday of each month, except for September, because that's when the Cowpea Festival is. If you want to know about the Cowpea Festival, see me after the meeting. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, November and December are your holiday months, so you know we, we don't try to work that in uh, there. And then the Hawassi River Heritage Center was born. Uh, we opened in May of 2013. Now. You do the math. 9, 10, 11, 12. Less than five years after we were chartered, we had purchased the building. <laughs> we have had, since May of 2013, approximately 1,000 visitors already. It's just, it, it's, it is so overwhelming to me, the people that, that stop by. And if we could get a sign on the interstate that says we're there, we're less than, we're what, three miles from the interstate? Mm -hmm. We're 60,000 cars pass every day. If we had a sign on the interstate, could you imagine how many people would be there? It would be, we wouldn't be able to hold it. Um, this is one of the pictures of the inside of our Heritage Center. All of these panels were done uh, by MTSU, Center for Historic Preservation. 
This is another picture. And I have to tell you this, I love this. Y'all like our fireplace? This building that we purchased was an old bank building. This fireplace used to be the ninth deposit crop. <laughs> <laughs> now, how easy is that going to be to tear out, you know, and remodel? Nah, it's a bank building. It's built for security. So somebody had the brilliant idea. Let's make it look like a fireplace. Local stonemasons donated all the product and all the labor. Put us in a beautiful, we've got a little electric fireplace in it. So in the wintertime, it's, it's really nice. Um, a little bit about where we're located. In, have any of you, I know there's a few, but how many of you have been to Charleston or Fort Cass? Several of you are. For those of you who haven't, this is where we are now. I'm sure you've all seen this map. <laughs> this is where we are now. This is Memphis. This is Fort Cass over here. So we're almost all the way over across the state. Took us a little over seven hours to drive over. Well, that included lunch, right? <laughs> so, breakfast. <laughs> breakfast. Bre well, breakfast, right. We stopped for lunch and realized that we had changed time zones, so we had to eat breakfast. <laughs> uh, this is another map that you have all seen many times and many times today. This is Memphis, where we are now. Over here is where Fort Cass is. Um, this is a map that shows the, the different nations. The Cherokee Nation in 1835. Fort Cass is the very northernmost point of the Cherokee Nation at that time. So in 1835, if you were standing on the Calhoun side of the river and you looked south across the river, you were looking at the Cherokee Nation. If you stood on the Charleston side of the river and you looked north at Calhoun, you were looking at the United States of America. Now, just, just think about that for a second. You have Cherokee Nation, you have the United States of America, two separate nations, and the only thing that separates them is a small river. The river wasn't nearly as deep as it is now, just a small river. Now, that doesn't give you chills, man. <laughs> this is a picture of the outside of our uh, Heritage Center, and thanks to Jack, Jack Baker, we've been able to fly the Cherokee flag there. So, uh, and uh, this is going to be kind of the start of, of the information about Fort Cass. So I just want to, right from the very beginning, thank Stephen Corey from the National Park Service for everything that they did the week of that charrette. It was, it was fabulous. Y'all give it a hand. <laughs> Before they came to Charleston, they had done quite a bit of homework. I think Corey mentioned that. Um, in her presentation this morning, what all they had done. This, of course, is the historic Fort Cass Immigrating Depot map. It shows all the roads. It shows all the encampments. But they took out, and I'm sure you've all seen this, and most of the ones that we have seen up until this point, all of the ridge lines are so dark that you can barely see where the encampments are. So they faded that out, took out all those ridge lines, and made it so that we can see all the different encampments. Now folks, these are roads that I drive every day. Every day. And I never knew that there was an encampment right across the hill from my house. There was an encampment on less than a mile in this direction of my house. If I drive down the road and turn down the next road, I can see two encampments and a military encampment. Never knew that. Never. So they took that and they georectified it and laid it over Google Earth. And as you can see, they've lined up the roads with the roads that are there today. And all of those roads are historic roads that were there at the time of Fort Cass. My house is right in here. You've got an encampment here, an encampment here, encampments all along here, back here, along the river, all the way around. Then you've got encampments along this creek over here. 
the one thing that we noticed on our day in the field, and I have to say, that Monday, that day in the field with them, it was cold. <laughs> it was rainy. I think it even spit snow some, didn't it, Corey? It was freezing. <laughs> <laughs> it was a miserable weather day, yeah. but it was one of the most fabulous days I've ever spent in my life. To drive out to these places that I have always known, that I have driven by time and time and time again, and to stop and look at these and realize this is the same field. Not only that, there's nothing different. There are no houses there. There's no, there are a few barns in some cases, um, but most of the land is still just like it was in 1838 when the Cherokee were removed from that land. We have one subdivision at one of those encampment sites, and we have a cemetery at one of those encampment sites. The rest of the land is still farmland, just like the Cherokee used the land. And that's amazing to think, what do you see when you go to Ross's Landing? Is anything like it was in 1838? Nothing. But when you go to Fort Cass, everything, almost everything. Unfortunately, we don't have the buildings. You know, that's, that's a sad point to it. Um, but we have, I think we have discovered where some of those buildings would have stood. So there are the two maps <coughs> side by side so that you can kind of see uh, how those would lay out. Now this is a picture from one of the sites that we visited on that day. One of the things that we discovered was most of the encampments were on a ridge line, but all of the encampments were near a freshwater stream or a spring. That's something that every one of these encampments had in common was the fresh water. So why were they there? Well, you had a lot of people. You had to be able to give them water. You had to have a place where they would be safe on the ridge lines. A lot, a lot of thought went into where they were putting these encampments. This is another site, and this is a this is a different stream. Okay. This encampment area is. I remember I've got two big. Okay. Uh, yeah, this one is, the tree line in the back is the river line. So this encampment was close to the river. Um, but the military would have been um, a quarter of a mile maybe from this encampment site. This is another encampment site and this was a huge site. And this is where, Sher where Shirley and I both, when we got down to this side, of the, 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 again, the tree line <laughs> is the river line, and Shirley and I were both just about in tears at this point. Yeah. Um, and, and this was just at the beginning of our day, you know? And this wasn't later on, this was at the beginning of our day. But, but to realize, I mean, you've just got this huge flat field. On the maps, you've got fields shown in these same areas, but I'm showing you fields in these pictures. So everything is so close to what it was in 1838. Um, this is just uh, another, uh, another open field. I think this is the same one that I showed you before. The picture before was actually one that Corey had taken and the corn had been cut out of that field, and now they have soybeans in that field. So uh, it, it's still being farmed on a regular basis. In fact, we have a, a, a big produce company, a local farmer, who sells produce that operates all of this, this farm in this area and uh, uh, sells to all the grocery stores around. Stores around so. This is an old road bed that 
<coughs> discovered. Would have been easy to miss. It sits down off of the main road, and we just pulled over on the side of the road. Now, like I said, I've driven past this a gazillion times. I never knew that was there. And it's how far would you say off of the road, Corey? 500 feet? Yeah, something like that. Not, not that far, not that far. But I never knew it was there. An old roadbed with a, st a stone bridge. And there was an encampment near this area. So we've got all this pristine land and we've got to do something. It has to be preserved. If we don't do something now, it's going to go the way of Ross's land eventually. So we have to do something. We have to preserve this land. Of course, everybody's heard of Rattlesnake Springs. I'm sure. Has anybody hasn't heard of Rattlesnake Springs? <laughs> well, one of the big discoveries that we made on the day that we were out in the field, of course, we've all heard how many Cherokee were at Rattlesnake Springs. Well, what we discovered was, after looking at the encampment sites, the military was actually the ones who were encamped at the springs. The Cherokee were encamped down Rattlesnake, Spring, Rattlesnake Branch, and there was another large encampment across the road at the springs up above Rattlesnake. We learn something new all the time. You know, everything, it's like every question that we get answered makes another question that we need to look for. And it, it's just, you know, to you don't you don't realize that because the map had never been cleaned up enough to tell what the little symbols were. Once they got the map cleaned up, we could see who was camped where. All right, come in. Okay, so we this it, these are a couple pictures from the charrette. Uh, these are just a few of our many uh, contributors and uh, sponsors and interested parties uh, that we have worked with. Uh, of course, we've already talked about the National Park Service and, and MTSU. Uh, the city of Charleston has been fabulous. Uh, the Forest Service was at the charrette. Uh, Bradley County officials, uh, and, and not just our local commissioner for our area, but other Bradley County commissioners came to the charrette to see what was going on. Um, the Cleveland Greenway Board had a representative there. Now that we're talking about doing an interpretive trail, they want the Cleveland Greenway to eventually attach to our interpretive trail. So, you know, it's like everybody is jumping on board all of a sudden. And I'm sure there's a lot of others that I haven't mentioned, so don't, don't take it that this is the only ones we got, okay? <laughs> okay, so this is one of the maps that uh, Stephen Corey came up with. And uh, this, this, of course, is taken from the historic map. It shows all the historic roads. And it shows the little green dots are where the encampments were and the red uh, stars are points of interest that could be uh, interpreted. Um, this is another one just showing the historic roads. And the, the inset area here, that is the current town of Charleston, that little area. So Fort Cass was this entire area and all the surrounding area around Charleston. But Fort, Fort Cass, Charleston, is just one square mile. Okay. okay, so this again shows some more, uh, more of the campsite. This is where Corey numbered the campsite. And I don't know if you all can see those, but way over here it says 19 and 20. So we were able to identify 20 different sites on that Monday that we were out in the field, which was just fabulous to me. Now this is 
this is an overall plan and this is something that we may or may not look at in the future uh, but I love the idea but we have to figure out if this is something that's going to work for us but this is a driving tour um, which would be similar to a battlefield going to a battlefield and driving through and they've done two separate trails uh, this is option A and this is option B and each of those starts and finishes at the Hiawassee River Heritage Center and uh, you, if we use those plans we would uh, identify sites and have pull-offs where we could have interpretive markers or, or wayside markers uh, for people to read about what actually happened there now there's a lot that's going to have to go in to something like this being done before we can do anything we have to talk to the property owners because every site is on private property once we do that then we've got to make sure that it's all protected with and we have to do some archaeological uh, studies uh, so that's why I say this is something that if it happens it's going to be a long time because you've got a lot of, a lot of different private property owners that you're going to have to deal with Melissa and I'm Melissa Woody is my what do you call it <laughs> my sidekick <laughs> Melissa Woody is the uh, uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, president in Bradley County and uh, so she and I have kind of uh, taken this project on we're pushing everybody uh, like I said they got us started and, that, and now nobody can stop us this problem <laughs> but uh, we have we've talked about if we could just get two or three of those property owners to agree to a wayside marker so that we could identify some of these sites we would be happy well guess what folks we've already got two well actually three if you count uh, Bob Irwin uh, we've already got two confirmed and, and then one other Bob, Bob is a definite but then we have one other that is probably going to agree to it also so I said you know 20 years ago nobody would have talked to us about it but today everybody Um, this is a, a view of, this is an artist rendering that they did of uh, an entryway marker, uh, which you all know what Corey showed some of those in her slides and, and that it says that you're now entering this sort of forecast. Um, and then this map shows some of the areas where we might put those entryway markers. Um, we have been in contact with state officials and with county officials about putting these markers up we're still waiting after more emails and more phone call messages and about three months we're still <laughs> waiting to hear from all these people but we're hoping to get that soon because we have a grant that will pay for all of these signs and it's going to expire in December and we've got to get something done if we want to get these paid for um, this is another uh, plan for a walking and biking retracement trail uh, which there, there's two, two separate parts of that one actually uh, covers uh, follows a part of uh, the road coming into Charleston and into the Heritage Center <coughs> and then the other one goes out toward the river to, toward the bend of the river and um, we already know that one of the property owners that this would affect is willing to do this willing to let us put that that uh, bike trail on there and a lot of this that runs right along the river is TVA property TVA is on board TVA was at our charrette they have already started trying to help us with our um, historical trail experience uh, they have cleared and are getting ready to build a boardwalk area uh, along the cypress grove that they planted originally in the 30s and then it burned and they replanted it again in the 60s it's in a low-lying area 
where there are several springs. In fact, it's right behind the, the Lewis Ross property. Um, so they're getting ready to put this boardwalk in that will skirt these cypress trees and you'll be able to look out into the trees, you'll be able to see where the spring is. We'll be able to uh, interpret the Lewis Ross house from there. Uh, we will be able to do ecological interpretation, uh, wildlife interpretation, TVA interpretation, because TVA is a big part of the town of Charleston. Um, in fact, the movie Wild River, if any of you all are familiar with that, was filmed in Charleston. So it tells the story of TVA. But TVA is uh, on board with helping us and they are planning on eventually trying to uh, be able to get enough money that they can do an entire section of our historical trail, which will come back and meet our park. And the park is just across the road from this area. This is looking up toward our heritage center. Now this is the <coughs> intimate part of the plan, okay? The Heritage Center is, goes around, right back up here somewhere else, okay? Now, everything else that we know of that's in, interpretable in Charleston is about two blocks away. So how do we get from the Heritage Center to the areas that need to be interpreted? That has been a dilemma. So we have these ball fields there's two ball fields here, and we have this space. All of this is city property. There are no private property owners to deal with. The city's already on board. So if we can put a trail down through here, then we can get to where we need to be to interpret what we need to interpret. But what's, what's there to make people want to walk down that trail? Well, this is where Steve and Corey came from. I'm so interested. <laughs> and I've already heard it. <laughs> and <what's wrong> with <laughs> you? And, uh, so Corey showed you a shot of this. And the concept here is that the Trail of Tears had two sides to the story. You had the Cherokee side of the story. And you had the military side of the story. So to use the area that when you didn't have any idea what to do with and put in interpretive markers that would, one side would interpret and picture and have quotes from the Cherokee point of view. The other side would have pictures and quotes from the military or American point of view. And that would lead you down to the next section to get you into the interpretive part of our room. Well, folks, when we showed this, or when they showed this at the charrette, I don't think there was a dry eye in that room. Everybody was just like, you could just hear everybody, oh, you know. So, we have latched on to this. Before this slide came down and the next slide went up, Melissa Mortimer, who is the Historic Preservation Planner for Southeastern Development District, jumps up out of her seat. Well, she's pregnant, okay? <laughs> so Melissa and I look like, she okay? You know, she comes running to Melissa and she said, there's an RTP grant that's, it, uh, that's due to be in in just about a month. I want to write it for this. Well, if you don't know, an RTP grant is a recreational Trails program grant, okay? Melissa and Melissa Woody and myself got busy writing that grant. We have asked for a 200, we had asked for $200,000 and that's a 50% match which we already had from a local contractor who has agreed to do all the work for us. All we need is the money for the supplies and whatnot, you know, all the surveys and everything. We found out three weeks ago that we got that grant. We are ready to start. In fact, we've already done a couple of the steps.
they have to be done uh, toward getting, uh, getting started with our project. We have two years to put this first section of the trail together. As you, uh, these these two maps show. Oh, and let me go back. Go back to two slides, just a minute. I meant to say, um, this is the curve that we're talking about putting that in. Heritage Center is up here, and this parking lot is not there right now. Right now, it's a small ball field that is very rarely used. When it is, it's like a father and son out there playing catch or whatever. We do have the bigger ball field beside it that they use regularly. So a part of this plan and a part of this money will go to build a parking lot down here. So you can park here, you can walk up to the Heritage Center, you can come back, and then you would go into our park, which is where our interpretation would start, and then two slides. And then you come into this area. Now this is the cypress grove that I was telling you about. This little dot right in the middle of it, that is Lewis Ross's spring. That's where he got all his water. There's another spring right here in front of the Henniger house. Um, you can't really tell that it's there. This In the summer, this is backwaters. It's all filled in. So you can't see them in the summertime. But in the winter, when the water is down, then you can tell, you can see uh, where those are now. Uh, the guy from TVA did put his waders on and walked back into the uh, cypress grove during the charrette, and he found the Lewis Ross Spring. It's still there, and it still has the rocks around. But this would be the area where most of our interpretation would be done. This is just two different views of the same area. This area that is in, uh, shaded with the yellow here is where we determine the um, official buildings for Fort Cass would have been. We know that the Henniger House, because we have diary writings from his family, that the Henniger House was built at the site of the barracks of Fort Cass. So that was the one site that we already knew definitely. And through the studies and, and everything that Corey and uh, Steve did, we've determined that this would have been the area <coughs> where the main buildings would have been. Now, never made, never thought about it before, but when they said this, I'm like, well, duh, that's where our old downtown used to be. <coughs> so why wouldn't you go? take the, the part of town that was already established as a headquarters and turn that into your main town. So, and of course then the railroad comes through at a later time. Well, and that's another thing. Because, remember we talked about standing on one bank and looking at the Cherokee Nation and standing on the other bank and looking at the United States. Well, the United States had a railroad that was coming south. And it got to Riceville, which is less than 10 miles away from Charleston. And it was headed toward Charleston. And when it got to the river, what was it going to do? Cherokee Nation was there. There was also a railroad in Alabama that was coming north, but there was a Cherokee Nation in between it. When we had the charrette, somebody brought a flat in of the town of Charleston that was platted, was it the year before, was it the year before the removal, okay? The railroad was already drawn through at that time. So, why did they want to move the Cherokee out? They wanted their lands. And they got it. Now, this is the slide that Corey and Steve put up as their last slide that says the end, but I've added one more slide that says <laughs> the beginning, because it might have been the end for their week, but it was just the beginning for us, and uh, we are so happy to be working on this project. So, does anybody have any questions? Yes? At Rattlesnake Springs, what did you find to determine that the 
army camp there. Okay, go back to that very first, if you can find that very first map. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's You may not be able to see it on this slide, but we'll show you right there. Right there. Okay, the, the guide down here, you know, tells you this is Cherokee encampments, and uh, anyway, it's, it's really hard to read on this, but if you look at the forecast area right here, this little dot right here is shaped like one of these two, and I can't read it on that screen, but these are both military markings, and that is exactly where the spring is. Okay. Down the branch, this would have been one encampment down the branch here, and then the others across the road. How did you all determine the 20 camps? How did you figure those stuff out? Uh, when they geo rectified it, go to the next map. And they overlaid it. See, you've got the lines here. Those are the lines from the original historic map. And as you can see, all these little dots, they just look like dots on here. That's, that's where the encampments were marked on the historic map. Oh, Lori, no, you're right. you got to answer, not ask. Well, I was just going to add something. Okay, that's good. What was, what was really wonderful about the day we spent in the field is we took this map that we had overlaid and pretty much figured out, okay, these historic roads are the are now modern day roads and this, you know, according to this overlay, this is where the campsite should have been. And we used our iPads to navigate around and just, you know, a, a little modern technology that we wouldn't have had even five years ago to find these so easily in the field. And then, of course, as Darlene said, all of these similarities kept on adding up. And that's how we started to say, hey, I think we're on to something. I think we really are figuring oh, out so and, so and ground truthing where these campsites mm -hmm. were. And mm -hmm. now, you know, comes the really fun part for the archaeologists. Right. Hopefully, the, if the private landowners are willing, they'll do some surveys and, and really ground truth these yeah. places. And we are we are going to be in the process of trying to match some of those up, work on some of that. But it, back to what Corey was saying, we'd be driving down the road and she's here with her iPad. Wait, 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 wait! It's right here. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Darlene, another thing that we need from the, the general public is there has to be a map that was sent to Washington at some point in time, and it had to have, this before this map, it had to have things drawn out, maybe with uh, some buildings or whatever. We've never found a map before this one, so somewhere out there there has to be a map before it was established as Fort Cass. Back when it was and still course, before the Fort Cass, it was mm -hmm. the agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before the agency, it was Walker Ferry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there has to be a map somewhere. But something had to have been sent to the president, to the government, to Washington <coughs> D.C. to say this is going to be the you know future forecast right. or whatever. So if anyone ever comes up with that, yeah. we would definitely Please appreciate it. By the way, Gary May and Q. There's an army roundup. The army had a land target. There were 200 U.S. Marines that came up to Florida and invited some of them to garrison for cats. There's an army roundup. Oh, okay. They had U.S. Marines there. That's interesting. That, that little tidbit, I did not know. Thank you. Yes. Which is the farthest east uh, camp? The farthest east would be. Well, it's, it's, it's pretty much oriented north-south, isn't it, Corey? Yeah. 
So you're probably kind of the furthest east would be the ones up in the, the bend of the river. But farther below. But down here? Yes. You're probably oh. talking about some of these still that are down along the river because everything else kind of moves back this way. Are there any as far over as Chicago Creek? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is Chitata Creek right here. Okay. What's the other creek um, farther east here? Over here? No, farther east. Oh, over here? Yes. That's Chestuli. Chestuli, right. Is there, are there any? No, that there are not any that are, that are located on Chestuli. Okay. Yeah. I think they went to Chestuli when they moved away from Fort Cass. One of the groups probably set up there. Well, George Hicks was in that yeah. area, and I didn't get to hear the Moravian presentation this morning, but I know there's, in reading it a month or so ago, mm -hmm. there's a lot of accounts near George Hicks's, and they talk about all the encampments near there. Yeah. Okay. Mouse Creek, there was, when the, after the uh, revision to the, to the treaty, the government said, okay, you can do, do whatever you need to do. So Ross and them set up their camps away from Fort Cass with the exception of the Bell Route, or Bell Group. And they moved to Mouse Creek East West. What's that called? First camp, second camp? Middle encampment. Yeah. Um, Candy's Creek. And then we, the Hildebrand's the only one we do not know where he officially set up. That would have been the furthest away. Probably. But that was in October. That he would have set his camp up. Anything else? Just to put it back in perspective, when we were talking about that Charleston was a square mile, but wasn't that whole Fort Cass area the estimate was, or was it 5 by 12? Is that about what? 4 by 12. 4 by 12. 4 by 12. 4 by 12. 12. 12. 12. But, well, miles takes you to the other side of Cleveland. Yeah. So, that, and that's something Shirley and I are working on. Yeah, we are. We're trying to decide where we're that trying to figure that. From. We're, yeah. we're thinking that maybe at, at some later point when Hildebrand's group was added to it, that's where the 12 miles came into. We don't know. But we don't know for sure. That's just, we're, we're working on that. Yes. How was this place not developed before? It's amazing to me. <laughs> well, and, and I'll tell you this we have accounts. Uh, small little tidbits of historical accounts that citizens through the years have written down mm -hmm. and in I, I know of at least two maybe three that they write in there that the town tried to grow they tried to annex and the farmers would not give up their land and the people but to add it you know and so therefore but you know and I used to think like I said I grew up in Charleston I used to think it's terrible because we don't annex. And, you know, there are still some annexations that we could do that would not affect any of these very important historic areas. But our problem is if Cleveland starts annexing and coming north, they'll take these areas. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to do something. I'm glad now that Charleston didn't develop as a large metropolitan area that it could have with it being on the river. The distance between Cleveland and Charleston. Sorry. What's the distance between Cleveland and Charleston? About seven miles. Wow. You can pull a fence line around that area, but they can't come in and annex. Well, of course, the, the, the laws in Tennessee have changed now, so you can't annex unless uh, unless the people who own the land sign a petition that they want to be annexed. So right now we're safe with all of these. There's a, a two-story red brick building that is south and east a few blocks from the uh, Her New Heritage Center. Mm -hmm. We were in that area last year just driving around. Does that building go back to... Is that the, the Henninger House? I guess that's what the name of it is. It's over close to the river? It's kind of down, no, it's kind of a, yes, close to the river. The train yeah. tracks right behind yeah. it. Okay. That's the Henninger House. That's the one that I was telling you about was built on the barracks the site of the barracks of Fort Cass, Mr. Henniger was a wagon master for John Ross's detachment going out. And when he came back to Charleston, he built his house on the site of the barracks. 
And it was for sale not too long. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. Yes, it was. Did you have something you were saying? No. Anything else? Well, thank you all for coming.